Russia and Syria. From a prophetic point of view, I think it would be difficult to overstate the significance of the fact that Russia is now in Syria in, if you like, a personal capacity. When I came to the truth about 30 years ago, Israel was already in the land, and we had public lectures based often on Ezekiel 38, speaking of the fact that Russia was going to enter the Middle East, that she would one day invade the land of Israel. That would be the Battle of Armageddon, World War III, resulting in the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ publicly to the world. At that time, the prospect that Russia might have a toehold in the Middle East was a matter of faith. Because of the power of the United States and her allies in the latter half of the 20th century, there was almost nothing, it appeared, that Russia could do to get into the Middle East. And various forays that she had into that region, for example, into Afghanistan, were an unmitigated failure. But for the latter half of the 20th century, America was strong. In the first half of the 21st century, everything's changed. Russia's now in the Middle East. It's no longer a matter of faith. It's a matter of sight because she's actually there and she's been there for the last 12 months. The Arab Spring first affected Syria in 2011 with demonstrations and a civil war which commenced at that time. Russia, of course, had for long been a supporter of the Assad regime and she supported that regime militarily, that is, with military contributions. In September of 2015, she moved her own manpower into Syria. Heavy weaponry started to go in there. Concrete was laid in airfields. The port, her, her port facilities were built. And all of a sudden now, Russia's in the Middle East, despite what America thinks, despite what America might like to do. She's now there. And despite the fact that Russia says, you know, she's withdrawing or she's pulling back, the question is, she's there, or the point is rather, she's there and she's there to stay. Just to appreciate how significant this is, here's a news article from September last year when these things began to occur. For 70 years, American presidents from both parties have sought to thwart Russian influence in the Middle East. Harry Truman forced the Red Army to withdraw from northern Iraq in 1946. Richard Nixon raised a nuclear alert to deter Moscow from resupplying its Arab clients during the Yom Kippur War in Israel, of course, in 1973. Even Jimmy Carter threatened military force to protect the Persian Gulf after the 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Well, what's happening today? She's there, and as I say, she is there to stay, invited, no less, by the Assad administration. Recent wars in the Middle East have worn down US resolve. Abundant domestic oil uh, supplies in the US have weakened US ambitions and the need to defend access to Middle Eastern oil. The high cost of overseas deployment has reduced U.S. initiatives to get involved in overseas conflicts. In fact, Donald Trump recently suggested that even NATO wasn't as important as it once was. All this means only one thing. There's a vacuum appearing in the Middle East that is a superpower vacuum appearing in the Middle East, and it's very, very obvious to everyone who is seeking to fill that void. And look what's happening. Putin, this news article tells us, sending tanks to Syria, the largest deployment of outside Russian forces since the collapse of the USSR. This is Russia's biggest war in 20 or 30 years since the collapse of the USSR in the late 1980s. That's in Syria. What about Iraq? Well, Iraq says that Russia, Iran and Syria are now cooperating on security issues in Baghdad. So Iraq is now looking to Russia for assistance. Iran. Well, Iran is now wanting to buy Russian weapons, a lot of Russian weapons, billions and billions, like $8 billion of Russian weaponry. Afghanistan. 
is looking for Russian military hardware. Pakistan is talking to Russia about a new, as they call it, win-win relationship for Russia and Pakistan. And even Turkey, even Turkey wants to heal the breach between themselves and Russia. Interesting headline, don't you think? Russia keeps its friends close and Turkey closer. Now that's, a, that's a, a statement we make about our enemies, isn't it? You keep your friends close and you keep your enemies closer. Obviously that's what the, the news reporter means by that title. But look at the comment that I've <coughs> excerpt from the news article itself. Henry Kissinger reminds us that in international relations, states do not have permanent friends or enemies, only interests. Don't be under any illusion. There really is uh, no compatibility between Turkey's interest in the Middle East and Russia's interest in the Middle East. The fact is they need each other for the moment. Russia will one day, and one day very soon, we believe, from a prophetic point of view, overrun Turkey, that is, by invasion and conquer Turkey, a long, long-held dream of Russia, which will one day very soon be realised. But the point of me showing you all those slides is that's the emerging sphere of Russian influence, that section in the yellow, from the Mediterranean Sea all the way through to the Indus River in India, that enormous territory, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and even, as you can see, a part of Turkey. And the significance you see of that area that Russia is now looking to control and form alliances with is that is the area of an ancient biblical empire, an empire called, once called the Seleucid Empire. It was one of the divisions of the Greek Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. And the Seleucid kings ruled all of that territory for a couple of 300 years until the Roman Empire took over in the first century BC. That's the area that Russia is looking to control, and that is extremely significant from a biblical point of view. What we're seeing today is simply the re-emergence of an ancient empire that has existed before. This Seleucid Empire which has long gone, I mean, 2,000 years it was buried by the Romans. It's coming back to life, except now it's being rehatched as a Russian empire. Now, the reason I emphasise that, you see, is because that's the story of Daniel chapter 11. Here's what Daniel 11 looks like. This is the structure of the chapter, and I'm going to just go through with you carefully the verses that we've read this evening verses 1 to 9, and then jump straight to the end to verse 40. Verse 40, of course, commences the events of Daniel 11 from the point of view of the latter days. But to understand the enormous significance of those events, you've got to understand how the symbols are defined in the early verses of this chapter. So we're going to find verses 1 to 4, basically the Persian period and the emergence of the Greek Empire under Alexander. That's the story of the first four verses of Daniel 11. After Alexander's death, of course, you have what is called the Hellenistic period from about 300 BC through to about 160 BC, which comprises verse 5 all the way through to verse 32 of Daniel chapter 11. A, a, an extremely hostile period between two Greek generals, in fact, and their uh, coincident successors, one general to the north of Israel, one general to the south of Israel called in Daniel 11 the king of the north and the king of the south. And the significance, of course, of this section of Daniel is that they fought wars repeatedly against each other and Israel was in the crossfire. Oftentimes those wars were fought on Israel. And even if they weren't fought in Israel, Israel was often subject to the wrath of those kings as they variously were defeated by one another. From verses 33 to 35, there's the Jewish response. Eventually it came, and there's the Maccabean Wars, led by that gallant soldier, Judas Maccabeus, in the 2nd century BC, followed by BC 64, the rise of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, of course, destroyed the kings of the north and the kings of the south. There was one Roman king, as Scripture in Daniel 11 describes him, only one king of the entire empire. 
Of course, the Roman Empire was the empire that destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD and sent the Jewish people captive amongst the four corners of the world. And then, of course, Daniel 11 jumps the best part of 2,000 years, or 1,700 odd years, to, from verse 43 to the end to the latter days. And the reason you see that the, the chapter jumps in that manner is because no longer, from 70 AD odd onwards, no longer were there Jews in the land. And that, that last section is in fact a rerun of the events of the previous verses. We're going to see the rise in Daniel chapter 11 of a latter day Seleucid Empire, the very empire I showed you a moment ago. It won't be controlled by a Greek, of course, it'll be controlled by a Russian, but nevertheless, we have the blueprint for what's going to happen in the last days on the background of history in the early verses of Daniel chapter 11. But before I start in this first verse, you've got to bear in mind one thing. Of all the Bible prophecies in Scripture that we could turn to, to prove to ourselves what's going to happen in the last days, there would be, I think, almost none better than Daniel chapter 11 to prove the inspiration of the Bible. And here's an unlikely source I'm quoting here. This is a Hastings Bible Dictionary, and they record in Hastings Bible Dictionary words that you, you wouldn't expect to see in any serious Bible Dictionary. And Hastings is a serious Bible Dictionary, but look what they say. Chapter 11, this is Daniel chapter 11, shows a clear acquaintance with minor events in Antiochus Epiphanes' reign. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes is a man I'll introduce you to shortly. He was one of the kings of the north. He was a Greek king who ruled from Syria. Well, Daniel 11 shows an acquaintance with the minor events in his, in his reign and in those of his predecessors. In the, look at this. In the veiled form of a revelation of the future, it gives an outline of history from the time of Cyrus, the Persian, to the death of Antiochus. What Hastings' the Bible Dictionary is saying is that this is not prophecy, this is history. They don't believe it's been written before it happened. They believe it's been written after it happened. The older commentators regarded these details as signal examples of divine prediction. But since a revelation of the future is without analogy elsewhere in Scripture and without any apparent moral or scriptural import, this chapter or insertions in it are not allowed, even by those who regard Daniel as the author of his visions or the rest of the book to belong to the period of Antiochus Epiphanes. What they're saying is this. The detail is so enormously, so enormously compelling in these verses that it could not possibly have been written before it occurred. It must have been written after it occurred. That's the only way we can explain it, says Hastings. Older commentators note well, look at this, as a signal indication of uh, inspiration, which of course is exactly how we would regard it. Daniel chapter 11 finds itself in the Septuagint version of the Bible, which was written actually across many, many years, but mostly in the second century BC, before these events occurred. I simply draw your, your attention to that point to illustrate just how remarkable the events of Daniel 11 are, especially in, in the early verses, so much so that even people who write Bible dictionaries have difficulty believing that they were written before they actually occurred. All right. Daniel chapter 11, what's happening? Verse 1. In the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. The I here is, in fact, the angel Gabriel who's giving this revelation to Daniel. It's Gabriel, you see, who's speaking in chapter 10 and verse 20. He's named, actually, in chapter 8, verse 16, and in chapter 9, verse 21. The first year that he speaks of of Darius the Mede is the year 538 BC, the beginning of the Persian Empire. Well, he says now, verse 2, I will show thee the truth, Daniel. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So you're simply reading about four future Persian kings the last of whom, the fourth one, the rich one, would attack the realm of Greece, that is, the emerging empire of Greece. The three kings that are referred to here in the early lines of the verse are, of course, 
uh, Cambyses, Smyrtus, and Darius Hystaspes, three notable Persian kings. The fourth king is the king Xerxes, far richer than they all, of course, inheriting all the combined wealth of the previous empires and massing an enormous force to go and to attack Greece. Xerxes' father, you see, Darius Hystaspes, had himself attacked Greece in 490 BC, and he had lost the campaign at the Battle of Marathon. Well, t- well, 10 years later, or oh, sorry, he died a few years later, and he begged his son Xerxes to finish what he had failed to conclude. Well, 10 years later, in 480 BC, Xerxes invaded Greece with, if Herodotus can be believed, 5 million men, crossed the Hellespont, goes towards Athens. Uh, the population of Athens was terrified, so they fled the city. Uh, Xerxes was looking for a conflict. He never got the conflict. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't destroy he couldn't at least take the city of Athens because there were no defenders. He, he knew that as soon as he left, the Greeks would simply return, so he burned the city down to the ground, razed it to the ground. So infuriating, the Greeks, I might say, that they forever after swore revenge. And every Greek mother hoped to bear a great Greek general who would one day take vengeance upon the Persians for what they'd done to Athens. And so it happens in verse 3. The response to Xerxes, the record now jumps 150 years amidst the rest of the Persian kings and goes straight to the Greek response. Verse 3, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. This is the rise of Alexander the Great. How do we know it's Alexander the Great? How do you know verse 3 is talking about the Greeks and not just another Persian king? Well, look at verse 4. And when he shall stand up, this is the mighty king who shall stand up in verse 3. When he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. There's the Greek empire, you see. Daniel chapter 7, a leopard had four heads, four wings on its back. Here's the Greek empire divided into four quarters, if you will, after the death of Alexander. And that empire, by the way, halfway through verse 4, would not be given to Alexander's posterity, nor to his dominion which he ruled, because his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And so what happened was, Alexander campaigns from Greece, leaping across the Hellespont and charging into the heart of the Persian Empire, 10,000 miles, and after 10 years of conquest, he had destroyed the entire Persian Empire and conquered it for Greece. Daniel chapter 8, I think in verse 6, talks about the ram, that is the Greek ram, meeting the Persian goat at the river. And the three notable battles that fell the Persian Empire were all fought at rivers by Alexander against the Persians. The empire would not be divided to his posterity, Because even though he had a son by his wife Roxanne, when the empire was, when when Alexander died, that son and his wife were given into the care of Cassander. You'll see Cassander there in the green. He was one of the generals that ruled Greece. Roxanne and young Alexander were both given into the charge of Cassander, who immediately executed both of them. There was no intention by the Greeks to let Alexander have any progeny that would rule that empire. And and what began as six eventually would have themselves down to the four generals who now we know from history, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Seleucus and Ptolemy between them are, in the words of Daniel chapter 11 and verse 5, the king of the north and the king of the south. That is north and south of Israel. You see, God's not interested in history just for the sake of it. This chapter is particularly focused upon the Jewish people and the events of the Jewish people. And so you read, for example, in verse 16 of the glorious land, or or verse 28 of the holy covenant, or verse 31 of the sanctuary. It's all about the nation of Israel, you see. And therefore, we've got two kings. Of the four kings of the Greek empire, only two are important in this chapter. The other two are ignored completely. It's only that king that was north. And that king that was south of Israel, because they fought against each other over the land of Israel that Rader mentioned in this chapter. Now, I'm just going to walk with you slowly through verses 5 to 9. It's easy to understand verses 1 to 4. Verses 5 to 9 are a little more difficult. And in fact, 
you're just going to have to listen to me and trust what I say because without analysing these verses closely yourselves, even with a coloured pencil to, to colour in the he's and the him's, of whether they're speaking of the north or the south, it's very easy to get confused in these verses. But if you take the time, you can do it. And let me tell you this, you can almost read any Christian commentary on Daniel chapter 11 in these verses. Everybody gets the same answer. There is no debate. I mean, no debate about the interpretation of Daniel chapter 11 in these early verses. In fact, down to about verse 36. No debate. Because the events are so specific, there is only one historical interpretation you could credibly apply to any of these verses. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 5. And the king of the south, so this is the Greek king who lives in Egypt, Ptolemy. The king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Now that's clumsily worded. Here's the New International Version translation of verse 5. Listen to this. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. Now what happened? The king of the south was a fellow called Ptolemy Sota. He was one of his Alexander's immediate generals, and he inherited the realm of Egypt. One of his princes, or one of his commanders, was a fellow called Seleucus Nicator. Seleucus Nicator, it says, shall be strong above Ptolemy Sota and shall have his own dominion. Seleucus Nicator was destined to become the king of the north, ruling the northern, if you like, quarter of the Greek empire from Syria, eventually from Syria. In the early years after the death of Alexander, as I said before, the, the generals fought. They began as six. They whittled themselves down to four. Seleucus, Seleucus Nicator, inherited, therefore, Syria and Babylonia after the result of that conflict. And here's a confusing verse, verse 6. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. That is, the north and south are going to join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. So this is a marriage contract to seal peace between these two Greek states. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Now you'll believe me when I say the hers and the he's and the him's are all, sometimes it's the north, sometimes it's the south. What do you make of that? Well, here's the story of verse 6. It says, at the end of years they shall be joined together. That is, in the year B.C. 255, 58 years after Seleucus Nicator took over as king of the north, the northern kingdom is now in the hand of Nicator's grandson, a fellow called Antiochus Theos. Now you'll see on this slide I've got the, the king of the north and his descendants in orange, the king of the south and his descendants in green. The king of the north is based in Syria, the king of the south is based in Egypt. And we're simply tracking down the family tree, as you go through verse 6, of the conquest and the enormous intrigues between these two branches of Alexander's empire. The southern kingdom is in the hands of Ptolemy's son, a fellow called Ptolemy Philadelphus. And things were hostile between these two kingdoms, and so they made a peace treaty. The king's daughter of the south, if you look at the screen, is Berenice. And she comes to the king of the north, it says. The king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. It was agreed that Antiochus Theos from the north would put away his wife, Laodicea, who's given her name to which city? Laodicea. And he would marry Berenice. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. Berenice retained influence over Antiochus Theos as long as her father lived. The arm in this verse is Ptolemy Philadelphus, the king of the south. As soon as Ptolemy died, Antiochus divorced Berenice 
and took back his old wife Laodicea. But neither shall he stand nor his arm. Theos wasn't safe. He'd upset a very mean woman. He would not be safe and nor his arm, that is his son by Berenice. Laodicea poisoned him and she's going to soon poison that son by Berenice. But she shall be given up and they that brought her, Berenice, was killed by Laodicea. They that brought her, the entire Egyptian retinue, the royal escort that took Berenice from the south up to the north, they were also killed, all those attendants. And he that begat her, you've got to read your margin carefully here, he that was begotten by her, this is Berenice's son, killed by Laodicea. And he that strengthened her in these times. Finally, Antiochus Theos himself was killed by Laodicea. The point, the reason, well, she wants her son. Her son, a, a boy called Callinicus. She wants him to be the next king of the north. That's what she's doing it for, you see. But look at the detail in verse 6. Verse 7, it doesn't stop there. But a branch out of her roots, out of, sorry, out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. The branch out of her roots, this is a branch out of Berenice's roots. In fact, it was Berenice's brother. Berenice's root, of course, was her father. Berenice's brother now takes vengeance upon the king of the north for the death of his sister. Ptolemy Euergetes attacks Syria in a combined land and sea battle against two cities, against the land capital of Antioch and the sea capital of Seleucia. Both cities surrender. Laodicea is captured and she is killed. Verse 8. And the king of the south now shall carry captives into Egypt, their gods, their princes, with all their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he... The king of the south shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the south has an enormous victory, you see, over the north in revenge for the north breaking the, the treaty between them, the peace treaty between them, at the execution of Berenice. It says at the end that he, that is the king of the south, shall continue more years than the king of the north. The king of the north, Seleucus Callinicus, died in 226 BC. The king of the south... Ptolemy Euergetes died five years later in 221 BC. And so verse 9, the king of the south shall come to his kingdom and shall return to his own land. Now I don't expect you to remember any of the detail of that. My point is simply this. That's the power of inspiration. That was written before the history occurred. And look at the enormous detail you've got in these first, what, nine verses now of Daniel chapter 11. Enormous detail, unprecedented detail in the rest of Scripture. The rest of the chapter of Daniel 11 follows in like manner. I'm not going to deal with it, of course. I think we've made the point. Here was the structure. We've just done verses 5 to 9, the beginning of the Syrian wars. And the south is victorious over the north by the end of verse 9. Well, you've got to believe the north doesn't leave it there. And there are continual hostilities now between the north and the south. And over time, because of the geographic size of the north compared with the south, the north began to prevail. And you can read the slide yourself about those various conflicts that happen. By the time you get to verses 21 to 32, the enemy of the Jews, we've called it, the most notorious king of the north arises and wreaks havoc upon the Jewish people. He was a man called, anybody know what he was called, by the way? Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes meaning the revelation of God or the manifestation of God. Because, you see, he thought he was a god. Antiochus Epiphanes, because of his conduct against the Jewish people, provokes, verse 33 to 35, the Maccabean revolt against him, against the Greek overlords. Remarkable. In fact, let me tell you just how powerful Epiphanes became. 
he was about to destroy the king of the south. And history records the fact that Epiphanes had had successive uh, military victories against the king of the south, and the king of the south could see the writing on the wall, and he knew he was going to be destroyed by the king of the north. Well, what does the king of the south do? He immediately appeals to Rome. Rome, of course, by this stage, we're about 160 BC. Rome is the emerging world power. And Egypt appeals to Rome for assistance. The day came that Antiochus Epiphanes marches down the coast of Palestine and comes up to the gates of the capital of the king of the south. He's taken everything and he's about now to take Alexandria in Egypt. And he gets within one mile of the city with an enormous army about to besiege Alexandria and he's met by a delegation, a delegation of Romans, just a small delegation. And he knew these Romans. You understand, these are pretty civilised people. Antiochus Epiphanes had been to school in Rome. Rome was a powerful city, even in the Greek Empire. And so he knew the man that came face to face with him outside the gates of Alexandria, a fellow called a Roman called Papilius Lanus. And Lanus says to Epiphanes, he says, what are you doing? Not nice, nice to see you, he said. What are you doing? He says, oh, I'm going to, oh, you know, <laughs> destroy Alexandria. He says, oh, there's the problem there. You're not going to do that. He says, oh, really? I'm not going to do it. Why is that? He says, oh, because, you see, we have an agreement with the Egyptians. You understand the Egyptians? These are Greeks. They listen like Cleopatra, Egyptians. Greeks living in Egypt. We've got an agreement with them, says the Roman. What's that? Well, you see, anybody who attacks them attacks Rome. So if you want to go and attack Alexandria, be my guest, but you understand you're immediately at war with Rome. Now, that was a problem because Rome could defeat Epiphanes. Epiphanes' answer, well, all right. I'll have to consult my generals. At which point, Papilius Lanus picks up a stick and walks around him and describes a circle around him in the sand and says, no problem, talk to them, talk to them all you like, but make your decision before you leave that circle. Which has given rise to the saying that we have, a line in the sand. Antiochus Epiphanes could not contest the power of Rome. He was so furious that on his way back up to Syria from Egypt, he, took, he vented his spleen on the city of Jerusalem, offered pigs in the temple, and you can see, provoked in the Maccabean Wars, slew thousands of Jews, because he was furious at having been foiled in his planned conquest of the king of the south. Well, from that point, we jump to verse 36 of Daniel chapter 11. And in verse 36, we're now entering the next phase of the chapter, a remarkable phase, because it says in verse 36 of Daniel 11, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and speak marvellous things against the god of gods. He will prosper until the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Now, what's happening in verse 36? Well, the slide will tell you. The Roman period has begun. It's B.C. 64. And the king, you see, no longer are we speaking of the king of the north or the king of the south when we come to Daniel 11 and verse 36. We're talking about the king. He's the king of both north and south because, you see, the Roman king controlled all four divisions of the ancient Greek empire and then some. There were not four kings under the Roman empire. There was one king. And this king will do according to his will. Now, how do you know this is the Roman king? Well, look at what you find out about this king in verse 37. He will not regard the God of his fathers. That's because, of course, it was the Roman Empire that introduced Christianity as the Roman religion under Constantine at the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. Nor the desire of women. There's the advent of the Catholic Church and a so-called celibate priesthood. Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, or verse 4, sorry, shows, he shows himself that he is God. No regard for the God of the Bible. He stands as God on earth by himself. So here's the advent of Catholicism and its companion, Eastern Orthodoxy, based in Constantinople. The Roman Empire that arose captured those four Greek kingdoms. Greece fell in 168 BC. Asia Minor bequeathed 
to the Roman Empire by Attalus III in 133 BC. Syria falls in 65, and Egypt in 30 BC. And so in a clockwise manner, you see the Roman Empire picked off those four divisions of the Greek Empire, so that by the time you get to verse 36, there is one empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, which is now, if you like, those four divisions of the Greek Empire that I've got there in purple, are all controlled by Rome. In 330 AD, Constantine, the first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire, moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople and now presides over the Roman Empire from the ancient territory of the Greek Empire, of all things. The reason that's significant, of course, is because this king, in verse 36, is the Christian king of the Roman Empire. He's the, he's the king that doesn't serve the religion of his fathers. You see, he's not a pagan, he's a Christian. And this king lives in Constantinople because that's where Constantine, the first Christian emperor, relocated the capital to. That becomes very important, you see. You, you must understand that because when you come down to verse 40, of Daniel chapter 11 into the epoch of the last days it says at the time of the end shall the king of the south push it him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind and the point is that there are three players in this verse and not two this is not just talking about the king of the north and the king of the south the him of Daniel 11 and verse 40 is in fact the king of verse 36 and it's a helpful thing if you were to get a coloured pencil and just colour in the word king in verse 36 and then all the hisses and the hymns and the himself all the way down from verse 36 to verse 40 just to demonstrate to yourself that the hymn of verse 40 is in fact the king of verse 36. What's the point we're making therefore in verse 40? Simply this. That at the time of the end, that is the epoch of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we prove that, by the way? Well, because Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, At that time, that is, at the time of chapter 11 and verse 40, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the people of Israel. Well, it's the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the time of the judgment of the household, verse, end of verse 1 and verse 2. It's the epoch of the last days. At the time of the end, verse 40 of chapter 11, shall the king of the south push at him, Turkey, the ruler of Constantinople. And the king of the north shall come against Turkey like a whirlwind. Now I say Turkey because, of course, that's the modern location of Constantinople, which is the place that the king of verse 36 lived when he was a Roman emperor. But here's the question. Why all of a sudden in verse 40 of Daniel chapter 11 are we reintroduced to the king of the north and the king of the south? When we've all just discovered that, if I go back one slide, the king of the north and the king of the south fell to the Roman Empire in the first century BC. How can it be, therefore, that we, we come back to the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40 in the 21st century A.D.? You see the problem. It says in uh, verse 40 that the king of the south shall push at him, and then the king of the north shall come against him. What we're reading here is a conflict between the north and the south against Turkey. At the time of the end, many, many centuries after the fall of the ancient Greek Empire. What you're simply being told is from verse 40 through to the end of Daniel chapter 11, we've got a rerun of history. We've got an ancient conflict that is resurrected. And the powers of the north and the powers of the south are at it again, just like they were in ancient times. Now let me tell you some history. The Roman Empire controlled Turkey from its capital, Constantinople, for many, many hundreds of years, until 1453. And in 1453, Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. It was overrun by as an Islamic empire, if you like, and it became from that point the, the Turkish Empire. 
Turkey controlled Greece, she controlled Egypt, she controlled Palestine, she controlled Babylonia. In fact, all the areas of the ancient Greek Empire, most of that area there in purple, was now controlled, and beyond, to the east, was controlled by the Turkish Empire. It was no longer Christian, it was Muslim. But Revelation 16 and verse 12 had said that Turkey would eventually dry up, and so she did from the 19th century. Egypt gained independence from her Turkish overlords and then adopted a very hostile position toward Turkey. Britain, which was a big player in Middle Eastern events in the 19th century, from that time was forced to intervene, and in 1882 she sent troops into Egypt to help maintain the peace. She needed to do that, you see, because in 1875, Britain became a majority shareholder in the Suez Canal Company. And so she had major economic interests in Egypt. And the last thing that she wanted the Pasha of Egypt to do was to go and have a war with Turkey and lose Egypt to Turkey, and therefore lose Britain's investments. So she goes in for selfish interests. Now, Britain stayed, of course, in Egypt until 1954, when Abdel Nasser kicked her out in favour of the Russians. But it was during this period, you see, that the King of the South pushed against him. Who is the King of the South? The King of the South is Egypt under the control of a foreign power. When the Greeks control, this is Egypt under the control of foreign power, I say, as opposed to being under Egyptian control, as opposed to having self-determination. When Egypt was under the control of the Greeks, she was the king of the south. When she's under the control of the British, she's the king of the south. If, if the Greeks leave, or if the British leave, and Egypt has got sovereignty, she's just called Egypt. That's how Bible prophecy describes her. And I make that point because, you'll see, in verse 40, Egypt is described as the king of the south, it must be Egypt, by the way, because that's how it's described in verse 5 of this chapter. We've got to be consistent. Whereas you'll notice that in verse 42 and verse 43, Egypt appears under the name Egypt. She's no longer called the king of the south. And the reason for that is very simple. When Egypt was controlled by Britain, she attacked the Turkish Empire. It happened in World War I. And the Turkish Empire dried up and Britain confiscated, if you like, Palestine from the Turkish Empire and by various means through the League of Nations gave it to the Jewish people. Balfour Declaration, you recall. Uh, subsequent to that, Britain left Egypt. So Egypt is no longer the King of the South after 1954. She is just Egypt. And that's why she appears as such in verses 42 and 43 of this chapter. Here's the interesting thing. This is Brother Thomas, many, many years before any of the event, these events happened, writing in Elpis Israel in about 1840, 1860. The lion power, this is the British, will not interest itself in behalf of the subjects of God's kingdom from pure generosity, piety toward God, or love of Israel. Britain is not interested in Israel because they love the Jews. Not really. You know what Kissinger said? Nations don't have friends, they only have interests. Britain's interested in Israel, not in the Jewish people. God, who rules the world and marks out the bounds of habitation for the nations, will make Britain the gainer by the transaction. He will bring her rulers to see the desirableness of Egypt, Ethiopia and Sheba, which they will be induced by force of circumstances probably to take possession of. He wrote that before Britain entered Egypt in the 1880s. He says Britain's going to enter Egypt. He got it right, didn't he? They will, however, before the Battle of Armageddon, be compelled to retreat from Egypt and Ethiopia because the king of the north shall... Look, the king of the north shall stretch forth his hand upon the land of Egypt, which shall not escape. The record does not say that the king of the north shall stretch forth his hand upon the king of the south. It says he'll stretch forth his hand upon Egypt, which means that Egypt has got self-government again prior to Armageddon. So what Brother Thomas said by 1860 was, Egypt is going to be occupied by Britain, but Britain will leave Egypt prior to the Battle of Armageddon. How's that for careful Bible reading? Careful enough, I might say, to put it into print and publish it to the world. So pretty convinced of this position, excellent interpretation of Scripture, don't you think? Well... 
First World War fulfilled the first, let's call it third, of verse 40 of Daniel chapter 11. At the time of the end shall the king of the south, Egypt under the control of a foreign power, Britain, push at Turkey. We're sitting right now on the colon of verse 40 of Daniel chapter 11 and waiting for the time when the king of the north shall come against Turkey like a whirlwind. Now who is the king of the north? Well, if I was to put Daniel chapter 11 up against Ezekiel 38, which I dare say everybody in this room has done before, you'll notice that there's a... We're basically talking about two battles which are parallel battles. The geographic origin uh, from the north, from the uttermost parts of the north in Ezekiel 38, is the king of the north, that is north of Israel in Daniel 11 and verse 40. In Ezekiel 38, you've got this northern confederacy, both with hostile intentions against the land of Israel. The time of the conquest in Ezekiel 38 is the latter days. In Daniel, it's the time of the end. The point being the time of the epoch of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. His choice of military vassals the same, Persia, Ethiopia, they're they're mentioned in in these chapters. Libya. The nature of a sudden interruption, God intervenes. Gog is successful in capturing the city of Jerusalem, but he loses it in an unprecedented manner, which he is not expecting. And then, of course, his ultimate rout and defeat spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and in Daniel 11. The point of this, you see, is that these battles, Ezekiel 38 and Daniel 11, are so similar that we believe they can't be anything but duplicate records of the same battle. The only difference is that in Ezekiel 38, Gog is presented as a latter-day Assyrian, whereas in Daniel chapter 11, he's presented as a latter-day Greek. But the point remains that they they are identical battles, which you can tell by the various characteristics of them. But you understand what this means. We're identifying the king of the north here as the Russians by parallel between Daniel chapter 11 and Ezekiel 38. But as far as Daniel 11 is concerned, the king of the north has got nothing to do with Russia. The king of the north is an ancient territory described between Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. That territory which was once occupied by the ancient Seleucid northern Greek king. What that simply means is that in order to fulfill the precise language of Daniel 11 and verse 40, Russia must take this area prior to commencing her assault into Israel. In fact, let's be careful. Russia must become the king of the north, point one. Then she must attack Turkey, point two, because the king of the north pushes at him. Then she must attack Egypt, point three, because that's what happens by verse 42. And then she must, after her various successes in Egypt, come against the the city of Jerusalem, and in the first couple of final couple of verses of the chapter, meet her end upon the mountains of Israel. That's the story of Daniel chapter 11, isn't it? That's the precise story of Daniel chapter 11. We're looking for a latter day rerun of an historical and, uh, hostility between the king of the north and the king of the south. And the king of the south, he's already done his piece. He's read his lines from the script that he's played his part and he's pushed against Turkey. The king of Constantinople, who in the events of the First World War, occupied Palestine. We're now waiting for the king of the north, a foreign power in control of that yellow territory, a foreign power which we identify as Russia from Ezekiel 38 by parallel between these two chapters, to come against the land, or to come against the, the Turks, the hymn of verse 40, and then Egypt, and then into Israel, where he meets his end, as the last four or five verses of this chapter conclude. Remarkable, isn't it? This is what Daniel's saying. But let's put some detail on that. When you start looking at uh, the division of the nations between uh, the north and the south of Israel in the Middle East, you, you find they're not just polarized according to the king of the north and the king of the south in the words of Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. They're also polarized according to religion. You'll be aware that the Middle East is a a Muslim area of the world. But there are two branches of Islam. There is Shia Islam, which we call the Shiites, and there is Sunni Islam. And in the north, called 
we're called here the Shiite Ark or the Shiite Crescent, is the capital of Shia Islam, based in Iran. And in the south, we have the capital of Sunni Islam, based in Saudi Arabia. And can you see that the, the ancient territory of the King of the North is fundamentally Shia Islam, whereas the ancient territory of the King of the South is fundamentally Sunni Islam. Now, that's a very powerful point to appreciate because prior to the Arab Spring and problems happening in the Arab world, the Arabs talked about a pan-European, sorry, a pan-Arabian empire where Muslims would get together, perhaps oust the nation of Israel from their land and form a great empire between them. Ezekiel 38, however, requires that the Arabs, or that the Muslims in the Middle East be split into two groups, that Persia would be on one side and that Sheba and Dedan would be on the opposite side. Persia would align herself with, with Gog, with Russia, Sheba and Dedan with the lion power of Tarshish and the young lions of the Commonwealth and associated countries. That's exactly what's happened, because look, Persia is Shiite. Sheba and Dedan, this is Saudi Arabia, Yemen, they are majority Sunni. So, so the... the Muslims of the Middle East are pulling apart, you see, in exactly the way we would expect in what, in fact, is a north-south divide, but exactly as we would expect from Ezekiel chapter 38. Remarkable. Quite remarkable. Dividing themselves according to religious lines between the king of the north and the king of the south in preparation for this final conflict. Remember this. It's a long time ago now. It was quite remarkable, you know, the American elections of the year 2000 when George Bush, this is George Bush Jr., got in for his first term. It appeared as though Al Gore was, a, was likely to be a better presidential ca uh, candidate than George Bush. But it wasn't to be, and by, in fact, an extremely slim margin and allegations all over the place of poor vote counting or poor voter turnout or miscounted, you name it, there was all sorts of allegations, but George Bush comes in. Now, Al Gore, of course, was a, somewhat of a foreign secretary for Bill Clinton. And he knew a lot about foreign policies and had done a lot of work. Well, that pretty much ended his career in politics. And in comes Bush, of course. Well, what happened when George Bush got in? 9-11 occurred, and he, he intervenes in two countries. And he conquers Afghanistan and puts it under the control of a foreign power because the Taliban was there. Then he goes after weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and he conquers Iraq and puts it under the control of a foreign power. As we've said before, Bible students across the world put their hands on their mouths and, saw it and said, I can't believe it. Two of the big four countries of the ancient territory of the King of the North have just fallen to a foreign power. How long will it be before America points the gun at Iran for Iran's nuclear ambitions and goes after Syria because they suspected Syria was hiding Iraq's weapons of mass destruction? Well, as we say, it never happened. It never happened like that. And I remember at the time thinking, well, how can this be? What we expect to see from Bible prophecy is that those countries all become occupied by a foreign power. That's the only way they can be called the king of the north. By parallel with Ezekiel 38, that foreign power must be Russia. If America owns two of the big four today, how is she going to ever give them to Russia? Well, I looked at it at the time and I thought perhaps the answer is that America's going to get embroiled in wars. The wars have become too complicated. She'll get the United Nations in. Russia's got veto power on the United Nations. Perhaps Russia will come in through that avenue. And all of a sudden, Russia finds herself in control of those countries. And perhaps that's how Russia becomes the king of the north. It's very hard to predict how things might occur and extremely hard to have predicted that. It wasn't through the United Nations that Russia was going to become the inheritor of that ancient Seleucid territory. When America left Iraq, she left it, frankly, in chaos. I mean, she left it under control, but the rulers of Iraq weren't in a fit state to run the country. One thing led to another, and there was a Sunni uprising in Iraq. ISIS took over, and all of a sudden, the world's threatened by a major, competent, and powerful terror organisation. That's what's brought Russia in. 
That's why everybody wants to talk to Russia. America's sick of fighting wars. They're a long way from home. Frankly, if ISIS gets out of control of the Middle East, it's not immediately likely to affect America. I mean, they're not going to jump in boats and go to America. Uh, but it is immediately likely to affect Russia. Uh, various Chechen rebels are strong supporters of ISIS. And Russia's already had to deal... This is on Russia's back door. She's got an urgent interest in getting involved here. And therefore she's talking to who? Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey. How do we address this problem? Now, it's all, it's all about self-interest for Russia. There's no, there's no question. And everybody's in this discussion for what they can get out of it. But this is what's happening. And my point is, ISIS will never be the world power they plan to be, but they are the catalyst that has brought Russia into the arena and will make her the king of the north. Now, I might even be overreaching in saying that by oversimplifying the point, but you can see that what ISIS has done is brought Russia into, into power in these countries, occupying the vacuum that America is leaving because they've got an urgent interest to address this problem themselves. So it makes complete sense for Russia to get involved in more than one way. They need to address the ISIS problem. They're also very interested, very, very interested in reforming an empire which they once were. Now let's make, make it clear what we're saying. There's no doubt that Russia will take Turkey. No doubt whatsoever. We know that Russia is the king of the north because we line up Ezekiel 38 with Daniel chapter 11. As I said before, in Ezekiel 38, Gog is presented, or Russia is presented as a latter-day Assyrian. In Daniel chapter 11, he's presented as a latter-day Greek. But when Russia attacks Turkey, he does so as the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11. That means he must control that entire Seleucid territory prior to taking Turkey. Well, he's already talking about security with all the nations in that territory, even Pakistan, right to the Indus River. Russia's getting involved in every single one of them. What you're watching, brothers, sisters, and young people, is the gradual, or not so gradual, reformation of the ancient king of the north. And Russia only put boots on the ground in Syria 12 months ago. Look what's happening. Look how quickly it's happening. George Bush unwittingly started to put the pieces of the puzzle on the table, and look where it's gone. Remarkable. By the way, have you ever noticed, just while I'm thinking about these nations, have you ever noticed that in Ezekiel chapter 38, Syria is never mentioned? Why is Syria not mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38? She's one of Israel's oldest enemies. She's anti-Israel at the time of the end. She's anti-Israel today. Russia's involved in Syria. Why would you suppose Syria's never... I mean, Persia's mentioned. Ethiopia, of all places, is mentioned. Why isn't Syria mentioned in Ezekiel 38? Well, I suppose, and it is my supposition, that Syria is probably annexed by Russia and she loses sovereignty completely and utterly. I don't think the picture is all that rosy for Syria. I think she's going to lose sovereignty completely, and therefore she won't exist by the time Russia takes Turkey and becomes the king of the north. Remarkable, isn't it? But when Russia becomes the king of the north, what's he going to do? Well, he's going to guard all the nations of the Middle East. Now, here's Ezekiel 38, and here's a verse that you know well. In Ezekiel 38, in verse, verses 5 to 7, Gog, it says, is a guard to Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. All of them are in his army with shield and helmet. Gog with all his bands, the house of Tagama, the north quarter, so France, Turkey, and all his bands, many people with thee. Be thou prepared, prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard to them. So he's going to go into these countries to look after them. He's going to go there with security as his main ambition as he puts all the pieces of the puzzle together and reforms the ancient king of the north. That's what he's going to do. And then what happens? He invades. He invades. And he invades in Daniel 11 and verses 40 to 45, let me tell you this, in a classic rerun of the ancient invasions of the king of the north. He invades as the latter-day Greek in exactly the same way as the former-day Greeks did in the early verses of this chapter. Let me show you what I mean. 
in verse 41. He enters into the glorious land. So this is the land of Israel. Now, Russia does not go into Israel to take Israel. He's got a different ambition. Because the king of the north, he never went into Israel to take Israel. Israel was merely a corridor. He went into Israel to get to the king of the south. That's what the king of the north has done in history. Well, look at this. He enters into the glorious land. Many countries will be overthrown, but these shall escape. Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So here's Jordan. Escapes, or at least is delivered. He shall stretch forth, however, his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So there's the target. The king of the north has always fought against the king of the south. He wants Egypt, and he's going to go after Egypt. Egypt, I might say, without the control of a foreign power. Just natural Egypt by itself. Britain's gone. And I say this is a classic rerun of the ancient invasions of the king of the north, and I'll show you why. Look at the last line or two of verse 40. It says that the king of the north, this is Russia in control of this Seleucid territory, he shall overflow and pass over. You might want to make a note that that word overflow occurs in verse 40. It appears in verse 22. And it appears in verse 26. It also appears in verse 10. And in verse 10... 22 and 26 of this chapter, it is always in reference to the king of the north. Each of those verses, 10, 22, 26, the overflowing is done by the king of the north. Do you see the point? We've got a classic rerun. He is simply doing what the king of the north has always done in ancient history. He's overflowing. He's bursting his banks. Yes, he goes through the land of Israel, but he's going after Egypt. He's going after the king of the south. That's why he comes through Israel. Remarkable. Why does he go after Egypt? What interest does the king of the north have in Egypt? Well, it tells you in verse 43, precisely his interest. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Now, why does he do that? Well, you see, he's got a score to settle. There's some unfinished business in this chapter. You compare verse 33 to verse 8. Now we read verse 8. Do you remember what happened in verse 8? As a consequence of the execution of Berenice, the king of the south wages war against the king of the north way back in 200 odd BC, and he's successful. And it says in verse 8, as a consequence of that, the king of the south would carry captives into Egypt, their gods and their princes, and look, their precious vessels of silver and of gold. That was never avenged. That was never avenged. All that money that the king of the south confiscated from the north and took into Egypt, the north never ever got back in all of these verses until verse 43. And down he comes in verse 43, the king of the north now going into the king of the well, going into Egypt after the treasures of gold and silver and the precious things. That's the rejoinder to verse 8, you see. It is a classic King of the North reprisal in the closing verses of Daniel chapter 11. Remarkable, isn't it? Settling an old score. And he goes to Egypt and he's successful this time. He doesn't get within a mile of Alexandria and get turned around. He vanquishes Egypt. He destroys Egypt and he takes it. Finally, Finally, the latter, day, the latter day Greek does what Antiochus Epiphanes could never do because of the Romans. And having conquered Egypt, then he does exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did do. Verse, 40, verse um, 44, Tidings out of the east and of the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many, just like Epiphanes did when he retreated from Egypt barehanded. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Go straight after the city of Jerusalem, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did. But he will come to his end and none shall help him. But here's the interesting thing as we close. Russia will invade Israel in a classic copy of the ancient Seleucids. But that's not all. Daniel chapter 2 tells us the confederacy of their last days will be united by iron. And in the image of Daniel chapter 2, iron speaks of Rome and the latter-day vestige of the Roman Empire, the only portion of Romanism that still survives, 
is, of course, Roman religion. So the Catholicism that unites Eastern and Western Europe and allows the image of Daniel chapter 2 to stand upon its feet. Joel 3 verse 9 says this, Proclaim war. Proclaim this among the Gentiles, sorry. Prepare war. And if you look carefully at your margin in Joel 3 verse 9, you'll say it doesn't, see, it doesn't mean prepare war, it says sanctify war. Once again, as in Daniel 2, there are religious overtones to the final conquest of the latter days. Epiphanies means, Antiochus Epiphanies, Epiphanies meant God manifest. Religious overtones in even the name of the king of the north. In fact, so, so ridiculous was Epiphanes and so possessed, self-possessed was he that the people of his day called him Epimenes, meaning mad one. But his name was Epiphanes. What's the point? The point is, this is not just the last invasion of the king of the north. This is, in fact, the last crusade. You must understand that when the pan-European army is finally formed with the blessing of the papacy, eastern and western arms of the Roman Empire unite and they come bound for the land of Israel, it will be to liberate, what, the second holiest city in Catholicism? Why not? To liberate them from the, the, uh, the Jews. To, to, to remove the Muslim problem that these crusades of the 11 and 1200s failed to address. And to finally plant his tabernacle upon the holy mountain. And he will be successful. Nothing will be able to stop him. Can, can you see, therefore, all of that, how that ISIS really is a sideshow? Here's the main event. It's a classic rerun of an ancient battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, and finally the king of the north is successful. Finally takes Jerusalem. Finally takes Egypt. Finally expels the Jews from the land, as Zechariah chapter 14 says, and he thinks he's just built the empire to last for a millennium. But God intervenes, and he comes to his end in an unmitigated fashion and is destroyed by the end of Daniel chapter 11. Aren't we living in remarkable times? All the nations have been gathered together for war. Everyone's playing their part. The major players on the stage have already taken their positions on the stage. They're simply reading their lines from the prophetic script. This is exactly what's going to happen. And if we're right, brothers, sisters, and young people, that the Battle of Armageddon, as Brother Dom said, is 10 years after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to judge the household, then it appears to me as though Christ's return is extremely, extremely near. I mean, he's at the door, isn't he? And judgment, therefore, is about to begin at the house of God. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel 
but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service where we produce two or three exhortations per week which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish thought for the days often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on World News events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation. So please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.